Hi folks, the closers here. Now, here are two very, very similar knives. Um, these are the uh, Fairburn Sykes Commando Knife. Um, Fairburn and Sykes were two guys who were engaged by the British Army to uh, come up with uh, fighting techniques for the... Uh, British commandos and SOE and people like that that were uh, operating during the Second World War. And uh, one of the things that they wanted to do was to come up with a knife that was particularly good for one job and one job only, and that is dispatching opponents quickly and quietly. Um, so they're not, they're particularly gruesome, gruesome tools, really. Um, it's just a spike. It's designed for sticking in the neck or through the heart of somebody else and bringing them to a rapid end, um, which, as I say, is just a little bit on the on the gruesome side. Um, the other thing about them, though, is these they were made in the, in the millions. There, there are three patterns, one, two, and three. The first ones were made by Wilkinson Sword, and they are very pretty with uh, cross-knurled handles and an S-guard and a little Ricasso and Wilkinson Sword and so on. Very, very nice, very, very collectible, very, very rare, and um, very expensive. The Mark II, which was a sort of simplified version of it, and then the Mark III, which these both are, which were a very plain pattern um, with a bronze handle steel blade, uh, made by many, many manufacturers. They're screwed together um, with a simple cross guard. They are mostly pretty much the same and little to tell between them from made from the early 40s right the way through and issued right up until I think to the 80s. Stopped issuing them now. Um, I don't know the particular reason for it. But um, there are millions of them and they're common as cat shit. And um, you can buy them today. Uh, the, there is very little to distinguish one from another. Um, I could sit here and be a bit picky and talk about the marks that are on these um, issue marks, broad arrow and the, and, and the manufacturer's mark and so forth. There's a very slight difference in the shape of the guard. This one's slightly bent. This one, whether it started life that way or whether it's gained that over time this one's got a sort of slight grind to the ricasso here um there's some very slight differences in the blade profiles that you would get with different manufacturers but basically they're exactly the same knife there's many of them but what marks these knives out and makes them unique um is the provenance and um, if you if you buy one in a shop today, has no provenance whatsoever. But these two both saw service in World War Two, and so each of them, in its own way, tells a story, um, which is uh, unique in and of itself. And it's nothing really to do with the way that the knives are made, or who made them, or why, or whatever. But it's who they were issued to, um, and they're very different. The this one here, which has a full video somewhere back in the depth of time, belonged to my grandfather, Air Vice Marshal Desmond Ernest, known as Ted Hawkins, um, CB, CB, DSO and Bar. And um, three mentions in dispatches as well, one of which was for when he was uh, carrying this knife. Um, he was a pilot in the Second World War, um, flew right the way through from the outset of the war, right the way through to the end, carried on in the RAF and eventually retired in, I think, 1975 um, at the rank of Air Vice Marshal. But towards the end of the war, he saw service in the Far East and he was flying the in behind enemy lines, in behind the Japanese enemy lines. And they were told if you carried a... If you, if you had a gun, if you used it, you would bring the entire Japanese army down on top of you. So the last thing you wanted was to, for that to happen. You certainly didn't want to get captured, but you may find yourself in a sticky situation. So even pilots and other aircrew were issued with these knives and they were taken aside and given some training as in where one ought to put it to best effect. Um, now, he kept this knife... He ended his, his days in a in a residential home and, and then in a care home. But when he was in the residential home, uh, he gave up his swords and he gave up his rifle 
um, because um, we couldn't really take them into the care home. But he hung on to this just in case, because you never know. And he was at the time probably 92 or something, I think, when he went into care. When he was about 96, I think, uh, he moved to another care home. And before he did, he gave this to me because he knew I collected these sorts of things. So this is a knife with history. And as I say, his history is remarkable from being a... a, a a child spy, 17 years old, walking across Germany, right the way through to um, flying Vulcan bombers and all sorts of stuff. There's loads of stories, and if you if you look up the other video on the uh, Fairburn Sykes knife, you'll find the whole story. Um, this one, I don't know its story as well, but it it's what I do know about it is enough to know that it's um, it's as unique and um, has, it, has its, as I say, has its own story. It's not in quite as good a condition, and the reason for that is because it was uh, found on one of the D-Day beaches. Unfortunately, I don't have the full story, um, so I can't tell you which beach, and I can't tell you who carried it um, and who dropped it. Um, I know that it was found by a young naval officer who was commanding one of the landing craft who landed several times onto the beaches of Normandy. Because, um, of course, you know, you, you'll, you'll always remember the sights from, um, you know, Saving Private Ryan of the landing craft landing on the, the beach and everybody running out onto the shore and getting shot and whatever. It was pretty gruesome, I think. But... Um, the landing craft, because once they'd done that, they went back to the ship and they reloaded with another load of soldiers or tanks or munitions or whatever and did exactly the same again and did it repeatedly over a period of days. So from starting on um, uh, D-Day and then and you know going on for the days after. Now, this particular chap, um, I think in the days immediately after D-Day, uh, did a bit of beach combing, and he picked up various bits of um, German memorabilia, but he also picked up this knife. Um, so I don't know who dropped it. As I say, these are common knives. It could have been any anybody. It could be some um, careless soldier that just hadn't sort of strapped it on properly, or it could be somebody who died on that day um, and, um, you know, gave his life to... Uh, save Europe and drive the Nazis out. It would be lovely, it would be great to know the story and to know who it is. Unfortunately, there's no issue numbers on these or you can't trace it back to a particular uh, soldier unless you happen to know who, you know, I was given it by the man who carried this. This one, we'll never know who, who it was and we'll never know what happened to the chap that was carrying it. But it, it you know, clearly it was dropped it it got a bit of rust in it. It's been sort of, uh, to some extent, preserved and conserved. It's never been refurbished, and nor, nor should it be. I don't think. It's um, it's one of the things, but it definitely um, is a reminder of those brave brave men that um, stormed the beaches. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if anybody can imagine these days, but the idea of running out of a landing craft. Uh, jumping into the water, getting soaked to the skin, running up a beach while somebody is shooting multiple machine guns at you um, and knowing that um, not all of you are going to make it across that first hundred yards of sand. Um, many of you will be uh, gunned down within um, the first few steps off that boat and who knows whether this person suffered that fate or whether this person went on to liberate Berlin um, a year later but that it's, it's unfortunate that we'll never know but one thing we do know is he was brave enough to take that first step off that landing craft onto that beach and face those guns he was prepared to do it and um, also of course the chap that was uh, the naval officer that was in charge of the um, landing craft did it several times back and forth, back and forth and, uh, you know, at any time he could have been hit by something bigger than uh, machine gun fire that um, could have disabled or sunk his landing craft. Um, and he wouldn't have been the first and he wouldn't have been the only naval officer to have died on that day. So these are, as I say, in, in many ways, these are nothing special.
these are plain, they're ordinary, they were issued in their millions, um, certainly hundreds of thousands, maybe millions is exaggeration, I don't know. But over um, a period of uh, 40 years, these things were issued, many, many of them, and and so they, they, in some ways, they are nothing. But on the other hand, they mean everything, because these were, these were the, the young men that put their lives on the line to defeat the Nazi and the Japanese um, armies and bring the stability to the world, which, when we look at it today, we're in the middle of the Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we could be on the verge of another such testing time. I hope very much that we are not, because one thing that these things do tell us is that there is a brutality in war which is um, really horrible. Um, the, these knives, as I say, this is seven inches of steel. They're not sharp. They don't have sharp edges. They no, some people will tell you they serve a sharp end, but most of them didn't. They have a very sharp needle point, and they are designed for one thing and one thing only, and that is for killing people. So they're pretty, pretty gruesome things. But they do tell a story. They do tell their own story of the of the bravery of these people that were prepared to kill and or be killed for freedom and the return of democracy to the world. Um, so on that note, I'll say, if you like this stuff, there's probably something wrong with you. But no, if you if you uh, want to remember these people, then. That's brilliant. Um, if you want to see more of my videos, then please subscribe and ring the bell. And I always appreciate a thumbs up and, um, uh, and a comment. If anybody has anything to say on these things, um, I will be pleased to hear it. So, an emotional end to that one really for me, but um, my grandfather is, is now dead. He, he died at the age of 98 a couple of years ago. Uh, very sad. Lovely man. Right. Thank you very much, folks. See you next time. Bye.